there's always opportunity to mess up <laughs> and that's an opportunity to learn. Um, someone described teachable moments as an unplanned opportunity for growth and I really love that. So what are the ways to do those small mess ups so that we can work toward that institutional change so it's not a big mess up when it gets to that institutional systemic level. Welcome to Lived In by Zoe Therapy Services. I'm your host, Micah Fay, and I'm excited to share with you a community of experts who specialize in helping you feel fantastic. That's what Lived In aims to be, an online hub for DIY wellness led by the experts and curated by folks who care. In this wellness series, I interview Richmond community leaders, vendors, and healers to empower you with a toolkit, one filled with healthy practices to make every day just a little bit better. So welcome to Lived In, your online comfy couch surrounded by friends and supported by experts. Come on in. We're excited to have you. Welcome back to Lived In. I'm your host, Micah Fay, and today we are here with Jessica Hawthorne, and she is the Director of Programs at the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities. Now, this interview is going to be a little different than all of our other interviews because you are a representative of a larger nonprofit that serves not only the Richmond area, but the entire state. Yes. So can you tell me the history of the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities, which we will from now on, for ease, call the VCIC? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So it was founded in 1935. So I am not the founder of what? the organization. Yes. We were founded in 1935, originally actually as an interfaith organization. So mm -hmm. if you go through any of our programming, we use this joke uh, and you'll hear it many times, but a rabbi, a priest and a minister got together uh, and it's actually not a joke, <laughs> but yeah. um, they call themselves the Tolerance Trio, and so we can think about historically what was going on in the 30s in the United States, across the country, um, in the world, of course, um, lots of different forms of intolerance taking place. Uh, this group in particular said we need to really focus on the rise of religious intolerance. This is the lead up, you know, in between World War I and World War II. Um, so they said, let's, let's be the people who have the conversation, because um, they said, you know, we are, so many people want to ask us about our identities and our religious identities, but they're too scared. So mm -hmm. let's be the people who go out and have these conversations. So that actually started in the late 20s. In November of 1935, the, this group called themselves the Tolerance Trio stopped uh, on the campus of what's now the University of Lynchburg in Lynchburg, Virginia, which is also a surprise for people yes. in the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities being founded in Lynchburg, Virginia. Um, <laughs> So anyway, they stopped on the campus on November 25th, 1935. Over a thousand people got together that day to be a part of that conversation and mm -hmm. kept gathering over the years. And so over the years, over the decades, people said, absolutely, faith is incredibly important and I am not only my faith. Mm -hmm. um, so let me talk about all of these other aspects of my identity and working toward more inclusive communities as a whole. So the national organization dissolved about 15 years ago. We still have a, we call it a federation of offices, which I love because it makes it sound like it's in Star Trek. But we are independently governed uh, right down the road on Staples Mill. We have our state office. We have a Hampton Roads office. And oh, wow. our mission is now to work with schools, businesses, and communities to achieve success through inclusion. Wow. So we not only focus on, as I said, that, that identity around our faith, but instead we're also, or in addition to, we're also talking about race, we're talking about socioeconomic status, gender, um, just all the ways we can be more inclusive uh, and create more inclusive communities and organizations. Sure. But I'm curious, can, you, can we talk about the evolution from the word tolerance to the word inclusion? Sure. So I, I will say um, I when I joined eight years ago, you know, we had already moved on to being inclusive communities and those sorts of things. Um, I, we had a, a someone in a program years ago is one of my colleagues was delivering a program and somebody said, you know, I really don't like the word tolerance because it sounds like I've agreed to tolerate you. And I've been basically saying the bare minimum is I've, I'm not going to kill you. Right? And tolerating you means I'll put up with you, mm -hmm. but I don't understand you or I don't want to understand you. I don't need to know who you are. Um, so inclusion, we define the, the definition we use at BCIC is the ability to belong, achieve and contribute in a community. Wow. Um, and to be accepted, respected, and valued. And I think when we use those definitions, a lot of times people will latch onto one of those words because that yeah. means a lot to them. For me, the word that stands out in both of those is it's and. We have to have all of those things for true inclusion. Mm. So we're getting more requests too to not only talk about inclusion because that's important, but we need to consider equity. So thinking about 
not only how we are treating one another in small groups and interpersonally, um, how we get along with everyone. You know, there's, there's always the conversation of, you know, care for your neighbor, those sorts of things. Those are important. And we need to think about systems as well. Um, and how might those be exclusive and not fully inclusive of people? Right. So then VCIC is a, a large program or large organization and you are director of programs within that. So can you tell me like what, who are the other directors? What do they do? Sure. And as a whole, mm-hmm. what is y'all, what do y'all's days look like? I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Sure. Sure. So yes, we are a large organization. I believe we are currently, we are larger than when, when I started. Um, by definition, we're probably a medium sized organization <laughs> and I am one of the directors of programs. So there's another, my colleague, Charm Bullard, who is fantastic. Um, and her focus tends to be on workplaces and businesses and mine tends to be on uh, on schools and charm also and charm and I kind of share the community things for right now It's it's mostly with charm, uh, but certainly I jump in on community events as well. So um, as directors of programs, we are um, We have some amazing colleagues who who support us in in delivering those programs And so mm-hmm. yeah, we work with a wide range. I will say historically VCIC's work has been with schools And so I'm really excited to to work with K-12 schools in particular. I have a personal passion for it. Okay, tell me about that. (laughs) So, yeah, I um, am the daughter of an educator. Uh, Actually, I'm the daughter of two educators. My dad taught for like a year and a half. (laughs) So technically, I'm a daughter of two educators. Um, And I'm married to an educator. And it is just something, you know, I I love working with teachers. I think about, I think, and I, I speak about this often is, I wanted to get into this work because I had a fantastic school experience and I recognized that not everyone did. Mm -hmm. Um, I had, you know, close friends who school was not built for them. I have family members whose school was not built for them. Um, I was rewarded in a lot of ways. And now I look back on that and I, I recognize how much of that too is about how school was built for people like me, learners like me, people with my identity. Um, I always felt included. I always felt cared for. I always felt challenged appropriately. Um, and not everyone feels that. And so I, I think it's really important to, to consider that. But that's why I'm really interested in working with schools. And I also think that there's such an amazing opportunity within schools to be representatives, microcosms of the community. Right. Um, it's something that is a touch point for everyone in a variety of ways, whether it's public or private school. Generally, it's something that everyone has access to at some point in their lives. And so um, I I appreciate that as well. Yeah. I mean, of course, I'm a teacher. And Mm -hmm. the reason I know about you is because you've come to my school and Mm -hmm. talked to me before. And I remember it wasn't you. Maybe it was Charm this year. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know. Um, Which is the best name that's ever existed. Isn't it? It's fantastic. It's fantastic. She jokes like, if you forget my name, just remember I'm charming because you're right. (laughs) Oh, it's we true. love that for her. It's true. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> well, I don't know who it was, but um, they were coming specifically to talk about queer and trans students. Mm-hmm. And what they started with was asking us um, our first memory of being othered mm-hmm. in school. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'll be honest with you, PDs and I don't usually get along. Um, <laughs> and I very rarely actually participate in professional development. <laughs> don't tell my boss. Oops. Um, but I remembered my first day of kindergarten Mm. and I went to a Christian school Mm -hmm. and a fundamentalist evangelical Christian school. So take that for what you will. Sure. Sure. And my first day I walked in and I saw all my friends because, you know, we've been going to the same church. So Mm. we went to the same school, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I saw them all and they were on the truck mat and they were playing with trucks. Mm -hmm. And I went over and I started playing with the trucks because I like trucks, but then there were dinosaurs and I like dinosaurs way more than I like trucks. That's a hard decision. So I merged the dinosaurs and the trucks, which I guess I could have gotten in trouble with for just the merging. (laughs) But instead, a a probably really well-meaning teacher thinking, you know, that she understood God's word, um, told me that little girls Mm -hmm. didn't play with trucks. Mm -hmm. And I said, because I've always been me, I'm a little girl and I play with trucks. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was immediately punished, sent to the principal's office on my first day of school, maybe for being sassy. Honestly, I I wasn't a fully conscious human at the time, right? I don't know. But I think I was sent to the principal's office for playing with boys' toys when Mm. I was so clearly a little girl. And that's not what little girls did. And little girls didn't hang out with boys. They were supposed to have friends that were girls so that the boys wouldn't have temptation. The boys were in kindergarten. Right. Um, And that's my first. And I actually shared it out loud in front of my whole, like, staff. 
um, because all the people around me were like, that is so screwed up. Like you mm. need to tell everyone that. <laughs> but you're right. Learning was made for kids like me, little girls, little white girls, little white girls who have a specific kind of intelligence, little mm-hmm. white girls who have a specific kind of intelligence and listen well, right? Like mm-hmm. it, school was made for me, even right. though I, my earliest experience of school was being othered. Mm -hmm. So that's what I know about your program is what I've experienced. Um, So what, I guess, what does your role specifically look like? What do you do every day? Yes. So, well, (laughs) every day it varies. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I look at my calendar and I figure out where I need to be. Um, I think, so the majority of the work that I do is professional development. Um, That's why I was giggling knowingly when you were like, I hate PD. I was like, I know, I do it for a living. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I I know that that's not the favorite of teachers. Um, And I mean, just hearing my mom talk about it too. Um, So I, majority of the time, do professional development. And I actually started as youth program coordinator at VCIC. Yes, and and still very much enjoy the opportunities to work with young people. in in these experiences so yeah we do we do kind of one-time professional development 90-minute sessions all the way up to like five day long retreats um, Mm -hmm. for educators and students Uh, not at the same time but maybe one day Um, that'd be fun yeah I know I would really love that yeah so in my time at VCIC I've seen more and more people reaching out for series of conversations. So when we are, it's it's much less of that one-time 90-minute professional development, which we will still do, Um, but people really thinking institutionally, you know, how can we engage with you all for a year or two years or three years, which I'm really grateful for because that's, you know, our theory of change is that individuals create systems and systems can change through that individual interaction and those, that relationship building. Um, So that is, that's, what I do is kind of that relationship building, that professional development. Um, and we've also been doing more kind of coaching and consulting as well with small groups who are decision makers within these groups. Larger groups. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. So then c- can I know about your personal journey to this sure. place? And, and especially you talk about individuals within a collective system. So mm-hmm. I'm curious, how do your individual and intersectional identities you know, result in your collective change or the work you do towards it? Yes. So um, I, I joke, I have a short, uh, short, medium, and long version of this story about what brought me into this work. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> I would like the medium to long version. <laughs> okay. Um, medium to long is that really simply, I grew up um, in, a, in a predominantly white neighborhood, mm-hmm. um, but I grew up next door to a black family. And um, at the time, clearly being aware of difference, but not really understanding what that meant and what it meant for them to be one of the few black families in this majority white neighborhood. Um, and elementary school being one of the few black families in the elementary school. As, as I went to middle and high school, it got more diverse. But very simply, I think I would not have had the conversation about difference mm. at such a young age if that, if that family had not been our next door neighbor. And they had a daughter who was around the same age as me. Um, and it just opened my eyes to different experiences and, and, um, you know, I would go over to their house and there would be different, you know, works of art around and different books and they would watch different TV shows. Um, and we would talk about it. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for that. So that's the long version. Uh, the medium version is too, again, thinking about schools, um, I actually ended up going to, as I went to middle school, it got more diverse. And then high school at the time, it was the most diverse high school in the county, uh, socioeconomically and, um, racially. So, and I mean, we had multiple nationalities represented, all of those things. Um, and again, at the time, I don't know that I would have looked around and gone, wow, this is the most diverse place I've ever seen. Look at all of the ways that I'm, you know, learning from this. And, <laughs> exactly. And looking back on it, that absolutely, that that exposure to different identities and different experiences and different ways of looking at the world was so important. And I was also fortunate, too, that, that I had some... Teacher, I had teachers along the way who were willing to engage in that conversation with us. Um, I actually got to go back to my elementary school a few Aww. years ago, it, do a professional development, and I was like, wow, this feels weird. That's so fun. <laughs> it, was, it was great. And there, the one teacher who was still there from when I started, or when I was in elementary school, I was talking to her later, um, and she ended up retiring that year, and I was like, no. But she said, Jessica, do you remember all the stuff that we did to help you all like learn about each other and difference? And I was like, honestly, I don't. Um, She said, 
we talked about that all the time. Like it was so intentional for us. And so I think about the ways that I benefited from that without even recognizing that that's what I was benefiting from. Yeah. So that's kind of the medium to long version is that, I th- again, I think about, and again, looking at schools as, as a microcosm of a community, right. I, that was my experience. Um, and that was my opportunity. Uh, and now I also recognize as well the importance of people need to be with people who are different from them. Mm-hmm. And they need to have some some safe space and some affinity space. And so I think about, again, those, those families of color or those families who might have been lower socioeconomic status when the schools were not as diverse, would not have had the sense of safety, yeah. may not have had the sense of safety that I felt um, in those moments. So I am grateful for that opportunity. And I also think about how often that may have been you know, exponentially more challenging for, for other people yeah. um, so that I could learn. Yeah. So then how do you sort of every day, and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, how do you sort of every day reconcile your white femaleness with the work that you do? And have you ever had anyone challenge you on that? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when I worked full time in in a nonprofit setting, I definitely had people say like, well, what do you know, white lady? And I'd be like, literally nothing. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I haven't had anybody challenge it that directly. Mm -hmm. Um, And... I think, particularly working with teachers, right? It, currently, ah. it is overwhelmingly a white profession and it is overwhelmingly mm-hmm. a female mm-hmm. profession. Sure. Um, I don't know the exact statistics off the top of my head, but I want to say it's like 70 to 80 percent white and then 70-ish percent female. Yeah. Um, 60, well, maybe it's 60 to 70 female. So um, I think it's important to ask that question, yeah. to say, yeah, and to acknowledge that, yes, I am a white female. Um, and I think about socioeconomic status, too. It was middle class. Um having that experience and then working with schools who are, you know, in a a wide range of places. Um, So I like to acknowledge that up front when I think it's important, when I think that, you know, when I recognize that my identities don't match the demographics of the school, um, I want to name that up front and say, you know, I'm okay if we need to, if I need to co-facilitate with someone or if you think there needs to be someone else who engages in the work, you know, and I can still do the consulting side of things, but I think about it very much when I'm doing professional development. I want to know up front, are people going to be able to engage with me? And that's not about me as an individual or my lack of expertise or anything like that. But if people already feel disconnected from in professional development sessions, if they feel unheard, if they are feeling like the district has not met their needs as an individual school, and then Mm -hmm. I walk in as a complete stranger who also has these identities, Mm -hmm. what's the point? You know, um, I don't want to work with people who feel like it's, you know, that I don't understand their experience. And I do want to work with them. I want, I think professional development is so much more successful when there is buy-in. Ooh, yeah. And I recognize that my identities might prevent that initial buy-in, but I still want I still want to work on the relationship. It's not like, okay, I'm out. Right. You know, y'all don't like me. <laughs> but instead it's, I understand that the buy-in might take a little longer. I understand that you were feeling unheard. Um, and I need to acknowledge that and recognize that that's not about me, but it's about previous experiences that you've had, um, and the harm that may have been done by people who look like me. Yeah. Really important to recognize that we are like walking representations of a larger system. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I think I try to remind myself that almost every day. Yeah. Mm. Just in any case. So I want to know, cause, cause you know, we are kind of a teaching series. So Mm -hmm. I want to know how do you maintain relationship um even when your identities are sort of preventative like mm-hmm. you said that you do sure practically for our viewers yes of the white lady persuasion yes. um <laughs> how how do we do yeah. that and honor mm-hmm. other people's identities sure um, especially people of color and queer yes. people how do we yes. do that um i appreciate the white lady persuasion because the world has persuaded us to fit into the white lady box um and that means a whole lot of things that are mm-hmm. important to think about so yeah relationships i mean i'm a re- just as a human i am a relationship driven person whether or not i would be in this <laughs> any job i would have is going to be relationship driven I, I remember doing a professional development one time and again the the majority of the faculty and staff at this school were um and it was kind of a magnet school were white, not as much female, I would say, or they were split gender wise, um, or shared among a lot of genders. Um, and I remember a black woman, a person I perceived to be a black woman coming up to me on a break. Uh, and it, I was there and I had a, a colleague who was black female as well, who was there. And I remember her coming up and she kind of walked straight past me and went to my colleague who was sitting right next to me. 
And she was like, thank you so much for trying here, but don't even bother. Like, oh, basically, gosh. like, I'm exhausted. This is hard. Um, mm-hmm. And she wasn't being rude to me by any means. It's just, it was very clear, like, oh, my gosh, another black woman. Let me connect with her. Right. Um, so they started talking. And um, as they were talking, and she was, like, crouching down because we were both sitting in chairs. Yeah. And as they were, as she was crouching down, she, like, starts talking. And she gets, you know, animated. And, and you know, she's clearly very passionate. And then she, like, leans over and, like, puts her arm on my leg <laughs> as she's talking to my colleague. And then, like, a minute later, she goes, oh. <gasps> I'm oh. so sorry. I just completely violated your personal space. I was like, it's fine. It's really okay. Um, and in that moment, you know, what I what I read that as is like, I am so comfortable yeah. that I can come talk to you. I mean, she was in the same room with her colleagues talking about like, they don't get it. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but also like she she felt that level of comfort. Yeah, I to... love that you became a piece of furniture. Exactly. Yeah, I, <laughs> like, I love that. Exactly. <laughs> um, like she is openly talking about how uncomfortable she is around, you know, these white colleagues who don't understand. And here she is. She feels comfortable enough to like not only have this conversation with, I mean, she did engage me a little bit, but clearly she was excited about connecting with my colleague. So anyway, I think about moments like that where I have heard from people um, thank you so much, you you know, you bringing this up. I'm so glad you are the one bringing this up. I'm tired of being the Ooh. the marginalized person who has to bring this up. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and I will admit, too, there are some times where people are like, you don't thank you for bringing this up, but you just, that's hard. Yeah. Like, this is really hard to continue this conversation. We're not going to be able to do it. Yeah. So thanks, but no thanks. And I get that, too. Yeah. Um, but I think that is important to recognize again you know like you said it's really thinking about the the representation that i have um and i need to own that you know and so when people say i'm uncomfortable when they're not willing to warm up to me yet okay you know you don't owe me anything (laughs) my you know my sincere hope for everyone is that there is going to be opportunity for more inclusion and more equity um and i want to do everything i can and control what i can in order to work towards that and I recognize that sometimes there, you know, people may not be in the right time or place for that to happen in that moment, but that doesn't mean it can't happen, you know, for years down the road. Right. So all of that is to say, <laughs> I just want to listen. You yeah. know, I mean, I think that's the most important thing is, is just listening and listening to understand rather than listening to respond. We talk about that a lot. Yeah. So uh, can I try to paraphrase? Sure. It, what it sounds like to me is you're sort of wielding your white lady privilege mm-hmm. when you are in a room of white ladies. Mm-hmm. And then you can be the bearer of the bad news. Mm-hmm. Yes. Which is that our system is inherently oppressive. Yes. Um, <laughs> but mm-hmm. in a room where you are the minority, mm-hmm. it sounds like you defer to the majority that is the minority in the yes. room. Yes. Um, okay. So I just, thank that, you. Yes. Right? Thank you. Absolutely. And I think in, in the room full of white ladies in particular, um, that is, I can speak to my white lady experience and my own white lady, like racial identity development and journey and right. recognizing like my learning around racism and those sorts of things. Right. Um, is, is an important thing to engage in. So then, um, I guess I'm seeing a lot of older especially white women, but Mm. white men too, being fearful of saying anything because they think Mm. they're going to say something Mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. I unfortunately have never had this affliction. (laughs) I will just say the wrong thing loud and proud. (laughs) Um, I'm curious, like, how do you help them? Where do they start? Mm -hmm. I will say too, I see that from all ages. So not just (laughs) just people who are older. Um, I think that they're... But I will say I I see it almost always in white people. (laughs) For sure. Um, so, I mean, I know I was given the message. I was, I was, we talk about conditioning in our work and yeah. the messages. I think about when I describe it, I describe conditioning is we're, we're sponges in the conditioning phase. We don't have a choice to say, yeah, that's a great idea or no, that's a terrible idea. We are receiving information. <laughs> sure. Um, so at a very young age, I was acculturated to not talk about race. It's rude. It's very rude to talk about race. Yeah. Um, it's very rude to point out difference. And yes, if you are doing it with a particular tone and for a particular reason, it is. Yeah. Um, but just to name that difference exists is not rude. Right. Um, 
so it took me a while to to unlearn that and I will still say I mean there are still moments where I'm like oh yeah I can like this is okay it doesn't have to be in whispered tones right you know I think about when people describe different people who you know they're working with or encountering like if you're if your tone drops or your volume drops and you're like that she's black that says that oh you work with black kids right That is signaling that this is not okay to talk about Mm -hmm. or that something is wrong with that identity. That is not true at all. Um, And I think many times people who are scared to say the wrong thing um, are operate are working on that, that messaging that they got, you know, from a young age. So there's a book um, that I've had a number of clients recommend to me that they've been reading. Uh, I haven't read it all the way through, but I skimmed it and I loved the concept. Um, and it's called, What If I Say the Wrong Thing? And it's by a woman named Vernay Myers. Um, and it's literally a guide to what saying the say wrong the thing. thing. Yep. <laughs> and I really appreciate that. Um, one of the questions we often pose to people um, who are in, in privileged groups is, what's the worst that's gonna happen if you say something? And then what's the worst that's going to happen if you don't? That's so really good. I think Alua says that in So You Want to Talk About Race. Oh, okay. I think she has on an entire chapter. Great. Nice. Um, and she actually, which as a teacher I love, she models conversations. Yes. And oh. how they might go. Sure. And how they go inside of your like lizard brain um, uh-huh. as opposed to how they probably are actually going to go. Right outside of your lizard brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I think she says, maybe not so clearly, but she does say so much worse can happen if you stay silent than Absolutely. if you say something wrong. Yes, that's on my list of things to read. I've not read it yet, but uh, I've, heard, I've heard good things. <laughs> I, th- I think it's like very entry level, which I love yeah. about it because mm-hmm. you can hand it to like truly anyone and be like, just, I think you should just start here. Right. And they're like, sure, it's blue, why not? You know, it's great. I love it. Right, yes. <laughs> so yeah, okay, so... Um, Saying something wrong mm-hmm. uh, versus not saying anything at all. Right. So if we if we say something wrong, there there's a chance that a relationship is harmed. Right. We mm-hmm. might um, at the very drastic side of that, we might lose a friendship. Right. Mm-hmm. Or we might lose a connection to a family member. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not easy. I'm not saying that everybody needs to go out and disown all of their family members either. <laughs> it's up to you. That's your choice. Um, but instead, you know, that's that's the worst that could happen. But odds are. If thinking about the times where the, the wrong thing has been said, it's it's going to take a lot to get to that point. Right. Um, there are probably going to be other factors too. It's not going to be that one time you said the wrong, the wrong thing that it led to that. Right. So instead, the worst thing that could happen is, ooh, I'm awkward. Ooh, I got to apologize. Ooh, I need to consider some change behavior. If I don't say anything, then people don't know, right? And it's sending a message where I'm reconditioning the people around me yeah. that that's okay to say. Yeah. And then we're missing opportunities to learn. Um, when we don't have that. And so when we we extrapolate that and take it up into the systems level, mm-hmm. really thinking about institutions, the systems won't change, right? So if we have if we have an experience um, with a policy or a practice or a law, it won't change if we don't say anything. Yeah. <laughs> so the worst that can happen and when, when that happens and those things can, can add up to life threat, what we call life-threatening acts when we talk about the different forms of prejudice takes, um, the worst that can happen if I say nothing is a life-threatening act. Yeah. I mean, so not to say, again, not to ask everybody to sacrifice all their relationships, but instead having that awkward conversation not only gives you an opportunity to learn, um, but it, it gives an opportunity for some larger change as well in our community. Right. So then how do you help people um, escalate up? That's a term mm-hmm. that my sure. community organizer friend uses. But mm-hmm. how, do you, how do you help people go from an individual change to a corporate one or... Mm-hmm. I mean, corporate in the purest sense. Sure. Yeah. Um, sure. Especially, I think, what I have noticed um, is that once white folk realize that their personal life does make a change, they kind of get a little stuck there sometimes. Mm. It's like, well, I'm nice to, to black people, mm-hmm. so I did it. Mm-hmm. I go to church mm-hmm. with one black lady. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and yes, that's great. You made a personal change. Sure. But honestly... Um, in the same way that we're not going to fix climate change by, you know, just recycling our own stuff, mm-hmm. we need to expand to a more uh, system-based yes. intervention, I guess. Yes, absolutely. So how do, we, how do we do that? Sure. So one of the things that we have been doing a lot recently, and I think this is a result of um, the racial reckoning we saw last year, you mm-hmm. know, and over the summer, um, so, so many more people are requesting to talk explicitly about race uh, right. in our programming, and um, which we, we did before, but I mean, people are saying we want a six-part series and we definitely want half of that to be about race. Um, yeah. So, 
We have been talking with people around racial identity development. Ooh. And I will admit for me, I, you know, didn't, this isn't a thing that I even thought could be a framework. <laughs> you know, I was yeah. like, well, I had my own journey. But again, I think people think about it as this is my individual journey. It may or may not be similar to other people's. When I learned about racial identity development, I looked at it and I went, oh my gosh, other people have this too. <laughs> really thinking about, and I actually think about, um, there's a fantastic book for those who are interested called Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? And A classic. Yes. Uh, <laughs> written by a black woman who tours and, and speaks in public schools all the time. And people would come up to her and she'd talk about race and people would come up to her afterward and say, you know, why do all the black kids sit together in the cafeteria? And she got so sick of the question, she was like, let me write, write a, a book, book. <laughs> which I love. Uh, and there's another scholar who we use a lot, too, who was like, why don't you ask that about, like, why are all the white kids sitting together? Mm -hmm. Like, why is it always about the black kids sitting together? Anyway, she also talks about racial identity development in that and the experiences of people. And when I read her book, I went, oh, my gosh, that's the experience I had with my next door neighbor um, growing up, being uh, me being white, she being black. Um, she describes how in middle school people kind of start to drift apart because, again, it's we're looking at racial identity and social identity development. Yeah. Um, she saw people who were more like her, whereas I was always getting a chance to interact with people who were like me. Right. It was not like we had a big falling out. Not at all. Yeah. You know, we absolutely stayed in touch. It's just that, you know, we had different friends. And then I looked back on that and I was like, oh, well, you know, people grow get older and they, they you know, have different friends. Uh, and I read the book and I was like, oh, she just described my life. Um, so anyway, all that is to say, <laughs> in reading about racial identity development, I can recognize there are larger forces at work on me at all times, on, on everyone at all times. And so um, this is not only about my individual decisions, but it is about the, uh, what was the phrase you used earlier? Uh, uh, the persuasion. <laughs> of the white lady persuasion. The white lady persuasion of like what it means to be a, a white person and a, and a woman. Um, that these are larger things that, you know, when you look at the kind of the big picture, these are little threads that are getting picked apart here and there to kind of guide me in a particular way. Yeah. Um, and it's not to say that it makes it sound like there's some person who's ultimately, you know, like a puppet master. That's not <laughs> what I'm getting at. But instead, being aware of these frameworks um, and my own racial identity development was really helpful because it helped me to understand that yes, some of this is about my personal decisions, but some yeah. of this is also about my need to learn more about how these systems impact me on a daily basis yeah. so that I can work with other people who might be in different parts, you know, in different places of these experiences. I have my own answer for this, but uh, where should people start for their racial identity unpacking? Oh, as far as like a resource? Yeah. <clears throat> I was like, just start, just ask. Just um, do it. <laughs> just do whatever you do. Um, I'm thinking, of, I was reading about the vaccine shots and people were like, well, the best shot, the best shot is the one you can get. And like with racial identity development, the best one is <laughs> learning about start. racism. <laughs> just ask the question um, and make sure you're not stopping there and always center the voices of people of color. Right. Um, do not rely on them to be your personal therapist. Exactly. Do the emotional work for you. Yes. Yes. Um, so... I think it depends. I, you know, we make a, a lot of different recommendations. Um, sure. So s I think centering, you know, the voices of, of black and indigenous people of color is important. Um, I will say with some groups, the first place in this, so this is going to con contradict that a little bit, um, it, that we recommend for people, particularly white women, that I recommend to them is Peggy McIntosh's Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. That was going to be my answer. <laughs> Um, so I, I recommend her as a starting place, not a finishing place, because yes, I, I want to make sure that, that again, as you're, as people are going through their own experiences, as white women are going through their own experiences, I find that one incredibly relatable, um, because she talks about her experiences as a woman and her experiences with sexism. Um, and then she talks about, in her introduction, she explains I was having this conversation with a black colleague right. and the black colleague was like, yes, and let's add race to that. And yeah. Peggy McIntosh was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Who? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there's some very tangible ways to understand how, again, this is not about individual decisions, but instead about the, the world in which we live and the ways um, that decisions have been made prior to our experience. Yes. So the list that she has... When we, when we do that in programming, we ask people, you know, think about which one of these is, comes down to personal choice. Yeah. And it is very hard to, find even to one. say that those are about, I was nice to this person. Instead, it's like, 
can I find greeting cards with people who look like me? Now that's changed a little bit. She wrote it in the eighties. She did, but, but I mean, I I grew up part of the rural poor, mm. um, the the red state rural poor, mm. and there is a particular chip on that mm. shoulder. Mm-hmm. And in some ways, there is disenfranchisement, and it kind of Absolutely. deserves to be there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. But I, being called privileged when I first mm-hmm. moved to work for it's a racial word. reconciliation organization, by the mm-hmm. way, at this mm-hmm. point, I'd known like 3.5 black people. Mm. I was not in a place where I should have been working for them. Mm. And the first text they gave me was Peggy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I grew up so poor. Like, I don't mm. identify with half of this. Sure. I don't know how to enroll a child in school. Mm-hmm. Like, I am 19 years old, you know. Right. But that was the first time that someone or like a, an invisible figure in the clouds, I guess, was able to show me what privilege looked like on a structural scale. Mm -hmm. Because in my own life, I hadn't really experienced my white privilege, Mm -hmm. or I I thought I hadn't. Right. And then then that was the first text that, um, you know, I used to be that person that got upset when you called me privilege. Mm -hmm. My accent would come out and I'd get real upset with you. Sure. Um, But that was the first text and I was like, Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, oh no, oh no, oh no, no. I've been doing it wrong for so long. Oh no. Um, and that was a, that was the text where I was mm-hmm. I, I was like, I am privileged. I am privileged. Mm-hmm. I am privileged. My yeah. my blue eyes mean something. My mm-hmm. white skin means mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, and and she's not a finishing point. Mm-hmm. And even since then I've learned to critique Peggy mm-hmm. um, and her work. Yes. But that's a, again a part of like you can get things wrong Absolutely. and then amend them later. Yes. You know what I mean? And yes. it still can be a big part of your journey. Yes. Well, Peggy, she can be yes. a big part of your journey. Right. Um, and you can still critique her work, her body of work. Yes. You know, later on in your your walk, I guess, is what I'm trying to say here. Absolutely. And I think I think about the importance of making small mistakes. You don't make big ones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and again, when we talk through the different forms that, that prejudice can take, the big ones are really obvious, right? The big ones, and, which people often say, like, I don't use her racist slurs. I don't tell <laughs> racist jokes. Okay, that's the obvious stuff that's really easy to point to. There's a, um, a really helpful graphic that, that people find useful sometimes around the, the racism iceberg. And oh, yeah. so, like, yeah, like a, what's above the water is the things like, you know, I don't actively discriminate against, you know, people of color. I don't, um, I keep coming back to that hurtful words and phrases, but like, I don't engage in physical violence with them, you know, that kind of thing. And the subtle things are what are the ways that, that our language might, again, the thinking about like describing the race of like, does my voice get quiet when I describe someone of another race? Right. Um, that is a very subtle way that could then lead to, not saying it always does, but it can lead to those really hurtful forms. Right. Um, and to your point around the privilege, I think one of the things that I I read the Peggy McIntosh article many times, and then like the fifth time I read it, I went, oh, she says something along the lines of, in the opening paragraphs, around the privilege des- being designed to be invisible. Mm-hmm. And that is always something that, like the second I read it, I was like, yes, yeah. right. Um, but I think that's what's so hard for people. It's designed to be invisible. It is not. Yeah. And it isn't until you're put in a space where it's super not invisible. Right. For the first time. Right. My first time was the hair store. I went to the hair store with a kid. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God, mm-hmm. the knapsack is not invisible in here. I right. see it so clearly. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, it was, it's not until you're forced to see it that you actually do. Right. I, I feel at least. Maybe I'm wrong. Yes. Well, and so, and this is where I go back to that. You know, I talk about my own journey and like being in relationship with people who are different from me and they, I was able to do that, but that's where it's also gets into that danger of like tokenizing, mm. you know, being with like, oh, oh. So I think that's where people want to overcompensate too, is like, yeah. let me go do that. Uh, and there are ways to, to engage and learn from people without necessarily asking them to tell you their life story right. and asking them to tell you all of the worst things they've ever been because yeah. no one ever wants to be summarized as their worst experiences. Right. Um, nor the voice for an entire people group. Exactly, exactly. Right. So there was something else around privilege that we often think about, but also just literally thinking about like our brains are designed to not hold on to information that doesn't serve us, right? So yeah. that's where privilege is being invisible is if I haven't been aware of this experience, then my brain is not designed to hang on to that information. Yeah. So of course I don't know about it. Um, now that's not to say it's an excuse, but... Just for me, that's helpful to remember, like, my brain was not hardwired to hang on to the ways that I experienced privilege, 
because it was invisible for me. My brain literally made it invisible because I don't need it for day-to-day -day survival. Exactly. Whereas people in marginalized communities do, do need, need it, it for day-to-day -day survival. So therefore, they're noticing it and seeing it more often. And also, I think about the erasure of individual cultures um, of whiteness and cultural experiences in whiteness. So thinking about the... Like, whiteness has become its own... Th kind of amorphous blob <laughs> so like it's hard to say like well I don't have any experience with whiteness or like I don't have right. white privilege because we don't think of it as a, a cultural experience instead yeah. we think of like we can say Irishness is a culture mm -hmm. um but I have Irish heritage I am not connected to that culture mm -hmm. so again it erases that individuality and that individual experience um in a way that can be nefarious for white people and so taking out that information you know, I'm not aware of it. And there's a reason it's been designed for me not to be aware of it. And that is to create what we have as a white experience in the United States. Mm. Because again, it's not a puppet master. It's right. a series of folks who lived in a very different time and had very different experiences than us, but still carried this, this white privilege and created a system that created sure. a system that created a system. Right. Right. And living within that system, mm -hmm. we benefit, I guess. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think too, I also like to help to, and I have to remind myself is these are about historical choices and they're about current choices as mm -hmm. well. So what are the ways, what are the choices that I'm making that I might be upholding these Structures. historical choices that I actually don't agree with mm -hmm. um, or don't appreciate or, you know, know are wrong, yeah. frankly, are illegal now. And like, what are the ways that that, that is getting perpetuated? What are the, what are the reverberations from those decisions? Yeah, definitely. Did you read the article about heat in Richmond by chance? I did. Or did yes. we talk about this? It's we been a while, but yes. <laughs> I thought that was the most clear, mm -hmm. like contemporary, well, maybe not the most clear. Mm -hmm. The most clear is probably when Richmond tried to tear down the MLK Bridge because mm. to restrict access even further from Churchill to mm -hmm. the fan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In any case, mm -hmm. um, there's uh, that was what, 2007? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we don't need to rank all the terrible things <laughs> Richmond has done in the true. name of race. <laughs> but the, we've got a lot. <laughs> the idea that, or not even the idea, the truth, I guess, that um, primarily black low-income parts of Richmond are hotter because they have mm -hmm. less tree coverage. Right. Coverage. Mm -hmm. I can talk. <laughs> coverage than the whiter, wealthier parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Such a small thing. Such mm -hmm. a... And... Those neighborhoods also overlap with lower life expectancy. Mm -hmm. They also, Richmond has one of the highest rates of childhood asthma per capita, yep. per capita, excuse me, in the United States, which I didn't know until a few years ago. And that's not an accident, you know? And again, not like there was a giant puffer master who was like, let me give everybody asthma. asthma. <laughs> that's not the case. Um, but these, give everybody asthma. <laughs> exactly. These small decisions add up. Um, and I, I always say, you know, individuals create systems. Individuals have bias. Systems, have, systems bias. have bias. Yeah. Um, systems don't come out of nowhere, and these they have they have compounded over the centuries. Right. Um, so our important our engagement in these things today is potentially perpetuating things for centuries more. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, that's a really good point. Yeah. Well, we spend a lot of time talking about one identity. Mm, um, yes. I guess which. <laughs> You know, being a white teacher of black students mm -hmm. is probably the one I talk about every day, and mm -hmm. that's maybe why mm -hmm. I, I lean toward it, because mm -hmm. um, at this point I feel like I have a vernacular or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But you work with other identities yes. as well. Yes. And I'm kind of curious about the faith portion of this, sure. because it's not anything we've talked about when y'all have come to my school. Right. Um, and of course, like, it's important to talk about queer and trans students, and mm -hmm. I would rather talk about that, honestly. Mm -hmm. But, like, can we talk about how faith intersects... <laughs> Your, in your identity and how sure. how you learn to talk about that? Sure. Um, so interestingly, uh, we we actually had a conversation with colleagues, like kind of a team building thing earlier this week, and we were talking about you know our, our religious identities. Interestingly, I identify as agnostic or secular humanist. Um, I was raised in the Methodist Church. I went to a Methodist seminary, um, <clears throat> and in that, so many people have what. A, one of my friends referred to, and I'd never heard this phrase, but it's evidently a common one, as church hurt, right? The, the church hurt them, or they had an exper a negative experience with the church. That was not my experience. Mm -hmm. um, I just ended up going to a church that was not connected to my community um, for a random reason, 
And I just, I was a shy kid and I didn't get along. Like, it's not like we didn't get along, but I was just like, well, I don't, I have a very close knit set of friends and you all aren't them. <laughs> yeah. um, and I ended up associating that with my faith, faith at a young age, which I recognize is not fair. Um, <laughs> so, um, it's yeah. not fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I have always been interested in, in the study of religion and, and, I recognize that it is a major force. So this is speaking Jessica as an individual, not a representative of VCIC, but you know, it's a major force for so many people. It is a huge influence for so many people. And that's important to me. And I love it when people are really passionate about it and willing to share that with me. So now I'll go to Jessica as a VCIC person. Um, we still do a lot of interfaith gatherings and, um, you know, really have what we call, you know, just we have a, a program right now called Table Talk, and it's not always about faith, um, but there are occasionally table talks about faith, and let's come together. Um, we have sister offices across the country who do what they call trialogues, um, and they bring together typically the Abrahamic faiths, um, which I can define. <laughs> if that's I was a religious studies major, so. I can tell. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. My yeah. best friend was too, and she oh, took an entire okay. class on Abrahamic feminisms. Oh, there you go. Um, so Judeo-Christian faiths, yes, faiths in which Abraham is a uh, the patriarch. Thank yes. you. <laughs> this means patriarch yes. apparently to me works for me. Totally works. So yes, it's uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Um, Abrahamic faiths. We, you know, that is our legacy as an organization, and that is where we have historically brought people together. Um, that is where we certainly have a lot of experience. Um, and so I will say we don't get a lot of requests for kind of our go out individual, like going out into a school or a community to specifically talk about faith exactly. But that is, I think one of our more, when we do our public facing events, that tends to be a, a conversation we'll have. Um, mm -hmm. Or after incidents of bias, of, of which unfortunately there have been so many Recently. across a variety of identities, but you know, um, attacks on synagogues and attacks on gurdwaras and um, those sorts of things. Those are times where we attack some Muslim people. Um, we'll, we'll convene people to, to kind of heal together and have conversation. Yeah. Wow. But that's maybe not as big of a part of your work currently as it might have been in the 1930s. It's, not, it's definitely not okay. at the level it was at the time. And um, I think part of that is just a reflection of kind of the conversations in the United States. Um, yeah. I don't, for whatever reason, people don't want to talk about it as much, um, which I don't understand because I'm a, totally a nerd for it and love it <laughs> and want to talk about it all the time. Yeah. But it's just, yeah, it's not, it's not as requested by people. Okay. So we've <clears throat> much overrun our hour. Okay. <laughs> and I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I That's love totally talking fine. about this. It's great yeah. to talk about it, mm -hmm. um, especially with a similarly identified person. Mm. Um, and I'm sure we got things wrong, and that's great too. You know what I mean? It's yeah, learning opportunity. Um, so I guess you've already given us so many like book recommendations and places to start. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, generally, sure. our community is an online one, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but where can we start with our individual <clears throat> journeys? Sure. And then how do we merge into a collective? Right. Um, movement or change sure. um like practically what Absolutely. what does that look like yes um there's a book called teaching for diversity and social justice yes. which um we reference a lot and in that there's this action continuum but what i really like is they talk about it as actively participating in oppression um or i think about that like as actively participating in supporting prejudice mm. and then there's a spectrum it's the action continuum so it goes to initiating and preventing prejudice or oppression okay and what i love is it kind of starts with, here are the ways that it's like very actively, I'm upholding this, right? So again, using those hurtful words, phrases, terms, I'm denying it, I'm ignoring it. But then it goes into some individual actions. So I recognize it, but I might not yet be ready to take action. Um, but when I do recognize it, maybe there are some actions I can take. So I think about it as a, I think of things in threes and I think of things in, um, I like it when there's, there's some continuity. So individual, interpersonal, and institutional. Love it. So if I'm on my individual journey, how can I learn more? Um, what, are the, what are the steps that I can take? So I think that's where seeking out resources. Um, people can be resources, but again, I think we've, I just want to reiterate it with an asterisk, <laughs> consider. I think about that in that interpersonal relationship, but there are so many people, this is where I love social media. There are so many people who are sharing their experience publicly that's, are a fantastic resource yeah. um, that you don't necessarily need to ask questions. You just sit and listen and sit and read and sit and learn. Yeah. So, I mean, YouTube, amazing resource. Now, again, 
with caution, but <laughs> don't look at any random YouTube about race. But um, <laughs> I think those are opportunities to do that learning without having to put the burden on the people who are experiencing that, that yeah. marginalization, that oppression. Right. So I think that's the individual side. The interpersonal is about how can I engage with people who are similar to me, who might be having these experiences? Um, how can we learn from one another in that way? And then the institutional is how can we take the system, right. you know, how can we how can we look at this as a systemic approach? But I don't recommend people jump straight into that institutional side of things without making sure that they're still recognizing the consistent need for individual and interpersonal work. Yeah, for sure. Because if it's just like, yeah, I've got this one, I did this one thing, I checked this box. Uh, one of my favorite ways of thinking about it is Allyship is a verb, not a noun. Mm, yeah. I didn't create that, but I love it. <laughs> it is not a crown we get to put on. It is not a pin we get to put on our lapel. It is a constant journey. Mm -hmm. um, and even people who do this work on a, a regular basis are still learning. I include myself in that. So yeah, just recognize that it's a constant journey. There's always opportunity to mess up. <laughs> and that's an opportunity to learn. Yeah. Um, someone described teachable moments as an unplanned opportunity for growth. And yeah. I really love that. So what are the ways to do those small mess ups so that we can work toward that institutional change so it's not a big mess up when it gets to that institutional systemic level? Right. Wow. Very cool. So yes, I highly recommend the action continuum. And then think about where you are. Think about, for individuals, I think about where are you personally? Where are you professionally? Where are you with your friends? Where are you with your family? If those things are different, what makes them different? Yeah. What are the ways to maybe make that more consistent across different aspects of, of your life and your engagement. Right. I think I, I, I will admit, I recently got the TikTok. Ah. Um, and I have really enjoyed following folks of color mm. that are talking about sort of the nitty gritty that you learn if you go to school for it, but mm -hmm. you might mm -hmm. not if you didn't. Sure. Um, and and then having their voices, which are personal, right? Mm -hmm. But I am not requiring any emotional labor from them. Exactly. This is emotional labor that they have chosen to yes. enter into. I Heart Erica is one of my favorites. Mm. Erica Hart, she's very okay. cool. Check Your Privilege is a really good one. Educators for Justice. Mm. I, her name's Letty, and I love her. She talks mm. about, like, the historic nature mm. of, the, mm -hmm. like, the, the creation of blackness, essentially. Mm -hmm. But basically, like, having access to all these brilliant humans yes. who studied these things I didn't get to study sure. um, and who I'm not requiring anything from um, mm -hmm. but can support financially if I choose to, yes, which I do. Absolutely. Um, and sharing is free, too. And sharing is free, too. <laughs> if you don't have the money, sharing is free. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's such... A, a beautiful part of social media, whereas most mm -hmm. of it kind of seems a little, a little dark. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. I think it gets a, it gets a bad rap, but that's yeah. why I, I I like to remember, and um, I think it's an amazing opportunity that we have in this current time and place. Yeah, and I also think about so knowing that most of your your viewers are in Richmond, um, recognizing Richmond's place as the birthplace of a lot of these systems. Um, and I'm not just talking about the Civil War; I'm talking about Virginia as a whole. Oh yes. Um, that is incredibly important too. So learning about your community history, um, is, I think, book is really important. That the Richmond's Unhealed History. Thank you. Yes, by Ben Campbell. Yes, oh, another Mr. white writer. Campbell. Again, a place to start. Yes, not a place to end. But yes, as a human, I've gotten Very to spend helpful. lots of time with him through the yes. organization I used to work for, mm -hmm. and that is an example of a human that is forever admitting he's wrong and yes. growing. Yes. And admitting that his God maybe isn't the same as he thought his God Definitely. was when he started. Episcopal priest, yes. I know. Absolutely. Episcopal priest. Current Episcopal priest. I think so, yeah, right? Yes. Did, he, did he retire just from his like public life? He, re he retired from Richmond Hill specifically. Right. But absolutely still goes back and, and gives lectures. And um, if anyone ever has the opportunity to hear him speak. So good. Um, yeah. Or go to their their He is a prayers. fantastic uh, public speaker. Yeah, truly. Mm -hmm. And that, no, now that I am a religious, I still like being at Richmond Hill, which I think mm -hmm. is, as a church hurt, church traumatized person, mm -hmm. I think it speaks There's some volumes. Amazing faith communities who are doing fantastic work <laughs> yeah. on anti-racism and anti-oppression. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. go to their daily prayers. They're super yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and well, they do retreats, which I love. So yeah. if you want to do a personal retreat, um, just like either in there. silence or, you know, with a group, you can do that. Yeah man yeah no it's a beautiful space i think it's got they've got some of the best real estate in richmond uh it overlooks the city it's gorgeous yeah but they're a very intentional community and i, I appreciate that and and they too just as, a, as an organization have learned you know in our 
recognizing that they have different parts of the community they want to work with. Yep. I think they do a really good job of changing after they learn something. Mm -hmm. After they get new information, right. they change mm -hmm. pretty immediately. Or it's, it seems to me they change mm -hmm. pretty immediately. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Richmond's Unhealed History is, is, again, a starting place. Yes. But again, I mean, that book, I actually did like a whole project on it in college mm. because it just, it made the, the spiritual connection that I have to Richmond yes. feel um, like I, I understood why I've always felt so spiritually Mm. rooted here was because yeah. there are voices here yeah. that needed to be heard um, mm -hmm. and I can't seem to leave this place so yes uh, <laughs> in any case this has been an awesome talk thank yes. you for talking with me yes again this is the beautiful and lovely Ms. Jessica Hawthorne <laughs> she's the director of programs at the VCIC the Virginia Center for Inclusive Communities check out the links in the bios that's what the children say. It's on the TikToks. It's I'm on sure. the TikToks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> check out the links in the bios uh, if you want to find a starting place. Yeah. See you next time, friends. Yeah.